Um, but today I'm thrilled to introduce our guest speaker, who I think all of you know from All About Books on the Nebraska Public Radio um, media show every week. Pat Leach is here and she's going to share with us the books that she's been talking about in her series, This is Nebraska, Books That Tell Our Story. So I'm going to turn it over to Pat and thank you all for coming. Thank you, Leslie. It's great to be here. For those of you who don't know me so well, I am Pat Leach, and if you are listeners of Nebraska Public Media and you regularly listen to the All About Program, you All About Books program, you probably recognize my voice, and you might have had that moment because I've seen people do this in person when I say, I'm Pat Leach, and they say, I recognize your voice. I see their eyes go out of focus while they're thinking of what they thought I looked like. <laughs> and then they go back in focus and no, nobody has, everybody's been very polite about that. I'll just, I'll just say that. But it is my pleasure to be here, partly because I was the director of Lincoln City Libraries for several years. I started working at Lincoln City Libraries actually in 1979 when I was a student at the university thinking that that would be my job for one semester and then I would go on and do something else. And I retired last summer after maybe 43 years at the library, uh, the last 14 of which I served as director. So this place is near and dear to my heart, and especially the Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors, which is on the third floor of this library, is especially dear to my heart as well. It's a special service within the library that is all about preserving and promoting Nebraska author, so I'm very pleased that today I could be part of this because that means I'm part of that. I want to say from the start that I'm really not the expert on Nebraska authors. So if you came thinking that you are hearing from the foremost expert, I want to just say I hope you had a good lunch um, <laughs> and that you will hear some things that you find interesting, but I'm not that expert. I am more of what I would describe as the book conversationalist. So I read a lot, I'm very interested in authors, I love to talk with people about what we read, I enjoy the kinds of connections that you make between books and between thoughts and ideas and between people through reading. I do that as a public librarian, so I'm all about the community aspect of that which sometimes seems a little bit different than maybe the academic study of literature, but it's all good in the sense of being about reading. A little bit about the This is Nebraska Books That Tell Our Stories project on the All About Books program on Nebraska Public Media. Last summer, NPR, National Public Radio, did a, just a quick little series where they put up a quick web page that basically said, if you're traveling to any of the 50 states this summer, here are some books about each state. And those books were chosen by state librarians, by state poets, by a variety of people. And the three that were listed for Nebraska were chosen by our state poet, Matt Mason. And they were all poetry books, which is great. It got us thinking, though. If we did a series that we called This is Nebraska, Books That Tell Our Story, what things would need to be included there? And the goal of that was not so much to create a big master list, and so I don't have a handout for you of these are the books that really qualify for This is Nebraska. What I want to talk about today are the conversations that we've had that focus on This is Nebraska, Books That Tell Our Story. And we've really built out from three books about poetry to having heard from a lot of people about what books they think would belong in that conversation. So again, it's all about the conversation. Now, our first session on radio was with Ron Hull as our guest, and he is a longtime public media person and personality. He's been very engaged in work to preserve and promote Mari Sandoz and her history as an author as well as her work. So he was my first guest, and those of you who know Ron know that he's a very enthusiastic promoter. We began in starting with Ron, also talking with Ron about many, much of his history with public media, bringing in a lot of speakers and experts about literature. So Ron was absolutely instrumental in very key interviews and 
key programs in terms of talking with the people whose information really needed to be kept and documented and who were, were fascinating people. One thing that we did early on was put up a social media post, basically just putting it out there. We're doing a series called This is Nebraska. What book do you think best describes our state? So I want you to just, I'm going to give you like five quiet seconds, and I want you to think of two books that you would have tossed into the social media world. Now I want to know how many of you have one of your books is by Willa Cather. Okay, so that's really common. We heard Willa Cather more than really anybody else. Mostly we heard My Antonia, but we also heard O Pioneers, as well as little mentions of some of her other books. How many of you would have Mari Sandoz as one of the books on your list? Okay, quite a few of you, but not as many. Uh, and, that's, and that's sort of what we found, that those two were by far the most mentioned. And then after that, we were all over the place in really a wonderful way as far as what are the other books that people are talking about. What was interesting is that an, another way that people could respond is people were invited to leave a voicemail message or to send us an email with their ideas. Now, social media is easy, makes it easy to respond. So when we did a social media post, I think we got 250 or 300 responses. We've gotten far fewer via voicemail or email. What's interesting is that when people have called in with voicemail or left an email, they don't mention Maury Sandoz or Willa Cather so much. They usually are sliding in some other books, and that's brought to my attention authors I didn't know about, books I hadn't heard of. And that has, been, that has been really very interesting. And it has also been interesting to hear people talk a little bit about the books. Some, and it is interesting, too, that some people are effusive in the message that they leave. You know, here's my book. Here's why. Here's why you should love it. And other people are very succinct. So it's also just been interesting to continue the conversation that way. What I did was reach out to some of those people to have a little bit further conversation, and some of those people became, became my guests on All About Books. There was plenty of serendipity about how these things happened, of things being mentioned three or four times within a short time period, where I think, you know, that's a book I hadn't heard of at all, and now suddenly I'm hearing about it several times in one week. We also found that how we ask the question varied a lot. So our general question at the start was, what book best describes Nebraska? So we just started there. Then we realized that if we ask the question, what book best describes a particular aspect of Nebraska? Well, that brought in quite a few other ideas. And then another way we asked the question was, what book best describes your experience of Nebraska. So taking it from a few different angles really made a pretty big difference. Excuse me. One of the people I talked to for this conversation is Ted Wheeler. Ted is an author who lives in Omaha, very engaged in the reading and writing community in Omaha, has published several books. And one of his questions in terms of his observations of various Nebraska authors and how they are accepted and his own books. He's written uh, contemporary fiction as well as historical fiction and some nonfiction based on Omaha's history. He noted that people seem almost always to prefer historical over contemporary. So I've been thinking, why is that? And I don't know, I don't know for sure. One thing I wonder is that it allows us more to have a memory of what we might see as a better time. I don't know if that's the case. Or if many of us are from Nebraska and feel like that's the heritage that we, that we came up with. So I'm curious to know in this room, how many of you grew up in Nebraska? Okay, so really quite a few of you are native Nebraskans. How many of you would say that your family goes back three generations or more in Nebraska? Okay, so that's quite a few of you also. I'm curious as to whether that's part of this preference for historical or whether that is something else, um, just in terms of what people seem to prefer when they choose their reading. Um, 
when, we, when I ask the question, what book best describes a particular aspect of Nebraska, or what is an aspect of Nebraska that we should think about, uh, one of my favorite conversations was with Clark Whitehorn, who's with the University of Nebraska Press. And he was a very enthusiastic conversationalist where a lot of what he wanted to talk about wasn't so much the books, but partly was. He wanted to talk about how Nebraska, to his mind, has a very uniquely active, engaged community of writers. And that he saw that as something that really needed to be brought to people's attention. Often when I'm talking with people who are in the publishing business or any aspect of the book business, I will say, what is it that you know about Nebraska be, through your work that maybe other people don't know? And that was, that was what he mentioned right off the bat, is that there is just this whole community of, of writers who know each other and support each other and engage in work together. I asked Clark which books he would maybe want to highlight in terms of This is Nebraska. And the book that, that he mentioned is this one, 50 Years a Country Doctor by Hull Cook. How many of you are familiar with this book already? Well, one person who happens to work at the University of Nebraska Press <laughs> um, is aware of it. Um, this is not a book that I had been aware of before. And it was interesting in talking with Clark Whitehorn about this particular one. Um, it, it is a publication of the University of Nebraska Press. It, and it is. Hole Cook was a country doctor in the Scotts Bluff area, I believe, for years and years and years. And so this is his story of being that country doctor, a whole lot of stories of various patients, of what it was like to be a small town doctor. Anywhere I would say, I believe his practice began in the 30s, 40s, and extending decades after that. So a lot had changed, certainly, um, when from, from when he began to when he ended. But I think that this is uh, one type of book that we saw quite a bit of a Nebraskan who, Hulk Cook is not a writer. That's not what his vocation was anyway. But he had a lot of memories to share that he wanted to be sure he got into a book. So when we're thinking about a particular aspect of Nebraska, we might say Hulk Cook as a doctor had a particular view and a particular experience. He's a very good storyteller. I wish that I could have had a conversation with him just to ask how much he had documented all along. I mean, you expect a doctor, of course, needs to make notes and have records of what is going on. But his ability to describe the weather, the car, the uh, making lots of house calls, the other people in the home at the time that he's there, and just his sense of observing people from his view as a physician really makes this book very interesting. And it, um, I found it to be so at any rate. Um, at the very end, uh, I, the way he ends is also a way that I thought, you know, he could also have begun with this because he wrote, as I approach the time when my own light will inevitably be blown out, I empathize more and more with Mr. Foster and his character and philosophy. He did not fear death and since so many people do, I should like to offer some cheerful reassurance by actually putting in a surprising plug for the Grim Reaper. Death is a comfortable, compassionate escape and rescue from whatever misery may have led up to it. So what is there to fear? Um, as I read, I do use a lot of sticky note flags because sometimes, and I imagine all of us as readers do this, you read a paragraph where you think, I better read that again. Or you turn to the person, uh, the other person in the room or in the car or wherever to say, I need to read this aloud to you and, and share it. So um, 50 Years a Country Doctor is a series of stories by Hulk Cook about his time as a country doctor. And uh, this is one of those books that I probably wouldn't have known about except for that conversation with Clark Whitehorn. One of my other conversations was with Don Mackey, who does work in Nebraska with economic development and he's worked throughout the country, throughout, the, throughout our state. So he's very familiar with Nebraska, and he's very much a student of Nebraska's political history. And uh, Don and I could have talked for a long time. Uh, he, as an amateur student of history, has kind of divided Nebraska's history post-Homestead um, Act into certain periods. And I think what he's doing is thinking about the history, but he's also adding in what he knows about books that maybe apply to that time period, and also movies that maybe portray a particular time period. 
When he and I talked, it's no surprise probably that Fighting Liberal, the autobiography of George K. Norris, or Judge W. Norris, was the book, one of the books that he chose. Um, I, when I started this book, oh, did, my, did I just cut out? Right, am I back? It sounds like I'm back. Okay, good. Um, when I started this book, I, uh, I'll be honest with you, you know, when you, when you have to read for deadlines, because I need to do a radio show, I just wish that every book was 200 pages. And George W. Norris gave himself 410. Um, but with a really good index. So a little sidelight here is a lot of nonfiction these days does not have an index. So I'm always thrilled to see an index like this. George Norris's book um, charmed me. I don't know what other word to use besides charmed me. He grew up in the 1860s and 70s. I believe in Ohio, as I recall. I should have made a few more notes here. Um, his book, in many ways, reminded me of the tone of, say, the Little House on the Prairie books, and many books that have a frontier or pioneer sort of setting where, a, where the family is such an important unit and where children are raised with a certain point of view about self-reliance and about hard work and where that is informing everything that he talks about. So, it's also what I would call kind of old-fashioned in a certain way, but, but lovely. And throughout the book, uh, he will talk about things that he did say in the House of Representatives in Washington that my husband, who is a student of political history, is just like, has he talked about this yet? And what's interesting is, yes, he will talk about major things that he did that changed the way Congress did business or changed the way that we did certain aspects of infrastructure. He will describe what happened. He will describe his role. But if you didn't know, you wouldn't know that that was a revolutionary change that he brought forward. And I think that is partly a point of view of his own that is probably more about being modest and not saying that changed everything. But he, uh, again, he's somebody who either took wonderful notes or who has a phenomenal memory or had a phenomenal memory when he wrote this book. Um, this is a little, just, just a little piece of how, of how he writes about his time in Washington and Nebraska. He, he wrote, I came back to Nebraska a year ago, before he wrote this book, because Washington in all those years never seemed to be home. The only home I can remember in all of its distinctiveness is Nebraska. I am part of its soil and its soil is a part of me. During those recent years when it was tortured by heat and by drought, when its skies were black and its sun a coppery hue, I had only to step to my window in the Senate office building and gaze out towards the gardens and the green stretches of the Capitol grounds in order to realize clearly the struggle through which my people were passing. So that's kind of a, a typical way that, that he uh, wrote about his life. Um, how many of you would expect that's, that somebody would use the title Fighting Liberal? for a book now. I think a lot of people, when I mentioned that name, were kind of like, um, it's interesting, too, how many people uh, from Nebraska know or do not know about George Norris. So I think a lot of the conversations in the legislature right now about the structure of the legislature, his name is coming up more. I feel really great that I had the opportunity to read this book when all those conversations were happening, to have a sense for what his role was in creating the unicameral for what his role was in terms of the Speaker of the House of Representatives and their role, which has certainly been in the news in the last few years. I'm amazed that this book, which I expected to be history, was really a lot about what's going on right now. So that one is Fighting Liberal by George W. Norris. How many of you have read this? Has anybody else read this? OK, a couple people. Anything you want to add to that? OK. Um, Another person um, that I spoke to, um, what, well, I spoke to a, a couple of authors actually through the course of this. And some time ago, I had spoken to Chris Harding Thornton, who is a contemporary author who um, recently had the book Pickard County Atlas. Um, have any of you read this? It's kind of a mystery slash thriller. A few of you have read this book. 
Uh, what intrigued me uh, about this book is it gives a particular view of contemporary small town life in Nebraska, and by contemporary I mean within the last 20, 30 years. And then I had recently become aware of this book, um, Deer Season by Erin Flanagan. This won one of the national awards that's put out by one of the Edgar Awards, a national award for mystery writing as her first effort. So I, I'm not sure that these are really, really well known. But each of them uh, is basically a, a mystery, a suspense book. And each of them is set in a small Nebraska town. And each of them is very much connected to probably the subcultures of the town that are not the honor roll students, that probably are usually found at keggers in the middle of fields at night. Um, with parents who may or may not know where their children are, um, with, with histories that are, that are difficult, frankly. And I was intrigued that, that these two books that were published fairly close to each other kind of take a similar point of view about Nebraska. So, okay, here's a question I have as you think about books about Nebraska, is what's the difference if a book seems to be written by an insider versus an outsider. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Or if a book seems to be written by an insider who seems to know a lot about how certain aspects of small towns function, but it might not be what the state's chamber of commerce would want to put out there for, this is Nebraska, books that tell our story. So I was intrigued by both of these books because of their uh, view of kind of the underside of small town life. I love a thriller. I like a book that has um, a few murders, several secrets. Um, I'm all over, I'm all about that. So I, and both of these books are very well written. Both um, Aaron Flanagan and Chris Harding Thornton are excellent writers. And so I found myself enjoying both of the books. I'm also from a small town in Nebraska, um, but that's not, that's not the small town Nebraska that I was necessarily part of. And so I was, I was completely intrigued by these two books. And I was intrigued by the interactions between law enforcement and people. I was intrigued by the way that the stories were told. Deer Season is about a teenage girl who disappears at the start of Deer Season. And then is the story of how they figure out what happened to her. And one of my favorite characters in this book is an outsider to the town, a woman who probably moved there 30 years before, but she's from Chicago. She's a bus driver, school bus driver. She's outspoken. And she has a reason to want to protect sort of an adopted son that she and her husband have taken on as they're figuring out what happened to this girl. And eventually, it be, the, the story becomes clear. I was also intrigued, somebody pointed out to me that the D in deer season looks like kind of a hacksaw. So I'll just leave that out there for you. <laughs> then um, Pickard County Atlas by Chris Harding Thornton, set in a western Nebraska town, a made up town. So um, she refers to actual Nebraska towns, but the town itself is made up. And in this book, kind of sense a train wreck about to happen. You know, a family where the wife is unhappy, living in the mobile home where they live, the husband who loves her, not able to see what it is that she needs, and a brother-in-law who, you, from the start, you kind of know is trouble. And again, as things happen, you, the reader, get a real sense of their lives and their town through this particular story. Um, I talked with Chris Harding Thornton, and it was interesting because as she talked about placing the book where she did, it was partly because she loved the Sand Hills so much. And uh, in an interview she talked about, as she was getting ready to write this book, she said to herself, well, where would I want to spend a lot of time? Because she'd be spending a lot of time writing the book. So she said, on the edge of the Sand Hills, which is a place that she loves. Now, one of my observations about both of these books is, uh, I would have to reread them to be sure this is true, but neither author spends a lot of time talking about Nebraska scenery. So it's very much the story of the people, but my experience of Nebraska people has been that even the most um, hard-hearted, 
stern, mean-spirited, awful. Just think of those people. Who are those people? Even people who would fall into that category have a favorite landscape. Even, even people who are in that category will like get to a certain bend in the highway and say, this is the most beautiful view ever. Or I think, I mean, my experience has been that people who come across as being hard-hearted will still say, I will, I will never stop enjoying this view from our barn door. Or I will never stop loving the scene from the top of this hill. So I was intrigued in those books that they didn't really spend time with that at all. So I'm, I'm just curious about that. And I know that myself, as a reader, I often look for the descriptions of nature in any novel. So you know, I noted that I often put little flags in books when I find an excerpt that I like. About half the time, those flags are about a description of nature that really struck me. So I was intrigued that neither of those had, too much, had very much of that. I still recommend them. Now, uh, we talked a little bit earlier that, um, before, before I began speaking, that this year's one book, one Nebraska selection, is The Mystery of Hunting's End by Mignon Eberhardt. And some of you might have been here last month when Rick Seipert, who is a professor at Wesleyan and an expert on Mignon Eberhardt, spoke. So um, this mystery is set in the Sand Hills. It's sort of a like a closed door mystery where a bunch of people have gathered at a hunting lodge and then people start to die and because of the blizzard that has shut them all in, you know the killer is, is among them. So that's the basic idea of the mystery of hunting's end. Um, Minion Everhart actually grew up in Lincoln. She worked for Lincoln City Libraries for a brief spell and her husband was a civil engineer. So they moved throughout Nebraska in their early married life and then she lived in many other places. She became a prolific writer of mystery. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with her, but she was considered America's Agatha Christie. She wrote so much and was so well known. In this book, she doesn't say a lot about the setting outside of that hunting lodge. But this is what she did say. It was, I am sure, the most extraordinarily desolate place I had ever seen in all my life. It did not seem possible that 12 hours from Barrington, which is actually Lincoln, from midnight until noon of the next day exactly could bring me so far, apparently, from the haunts of man, haunts of man from a crowded, pavemented, humming city into a region so wild, so strange, so morose in its barren reaches of sand and pine-dotted buttes and somber emptiness. I think that other writers have chosen to describe the Sand Hills in other ways, uh, but that's what she chose to say in this book. I'm very pleased that this was chosen for One Book in One Nebraska because I think it brings forward interest in an author who was one of Nebraska's most prominent authors for quite some time, someone who's not really well known anymore, and to give her some credit and the attention that she deserves. So that is The Mystery at Hunting's End by Minion Eberhardt. Thinking the question, what book best describes your experience of Nebraska, um, one of, oh gosh, one of the people I spoke with apparently, oh here's this book, is Cliff Taylor, who is a member of the Ponca tribe in Nebraska. He now lives in Oregon. And he has the self-published book called The Memory of Souls. And this book is his description of his experiences as a Ponca person listening to the stories of his elders and others and experiencing um, a phenomenon that he refers to as the little people. So throughout his life of these experiences are what he describes in the memory of souls. Um, Cliff attended the university for quite some time and so is very familiar with many of the people there and with a variety of Nebraska writers. And as he and I spoke, you know, it was one of those conversations where he would bring in more and more books to mention. So I really enjoyed my conversation with Cliff and one of the things he's doing in Portland is bringing groups of people together to write. So it's been interesting to me to talk with writers who then talk about their, their part of the, in the writing community. One of the other books that I read through this process is this one by Ledette Randolph called Private Way. Ledette was in Nebraska for quite some time um, in, the, in the writing community here. She now lives in Massachusetts. I had a, an interesting conversation with Ledette because Private Way is a novel, it's a contemporary novel set in Lincoln, Nebraska on a street that doesn't actually exist here, but it's clearly Lincoln with a whole lot of Lincoln landmarks 
included in the book. The basic idea in this book is that a young woman named Vivi had a technology company that was real, really, really successful in California where she grew up. Stuff happened and she ended up being harassed out of her job, harassed online, unable to do her work, unable to live her life, and she realizes that she just needs to completely separate herself from that. Her grandmother had lived in Lincoln, Nebraska, so she decides to move to Lincoln. She lives on a little street, and the book is about her interactions during this year with uh, four or five households that live on that street. And then she makes a lot of forays into places like the Mill or the Ross or places that we would recognize within Lincoln. When I talked with Ledette about this book, um, we talked a little bit about that question of insider-outsider. So Ledette grew up in, I believe, Custer County, Nebraska. Uh, she was at the university for a long time, uh, did remarkable work in the publishing world here. But in this book, she talks about Nebraska as an outsider. And so I was asking her if that's kind of a reflection of how she feels now. And she was kind of uh, interested in that question because she's been away from Nebraska now for a couple of years. So was that partly why she ended up writing this book from kind of a different point of view instead of an insider point of view? She said that the idea for this book came that she was interested in neighbors and said to herself, maybe I should write a book that's all about our relationships with neighbors. So, and think for a minute about how much you know about your neighbors that nobody told you, but you know when they drive away, you know when they come home, um, you know when they go out to get the paper, you know if they play loud music, you know if they pick up after their dog. Um, there are just a lot of things about our neighbors that we know, and that was her inspiration for this book. Um, I enjoyed the book immensely. One of the things that I'll talk about a little bit later if we have time, is she talks uh, quite a bit about how then she has Vivi intersect with Willa Cather. So Vivi's from California, not real familiar with Willa Cather, decides to read Willa Cather to familiarize herself uh, with the state. And there's a scene in this book where Vivi goes to Red Cloud. And she has been reading the book, The Song of the Lark, which you may recall has a character named Taya, who grows into being a musician. And Taya's bedroom is described. And those of you who have visited the Cather home in Red Cloud, know that that is, that the bedroom is there that's being described in the book. So this is what uh, Ledette Randolph writes in terms of Vivi's voice experiencing that. She writes, what I hadn't anticipated was how moved I'd be when I actually saw Cather's small attic bedroom, recognizing it immediately from her description of Taya's room. I was glad to be all alone in the room for a few minutes because as soon as I climbed those attic stairs and stepped into that space, I was overcome with emotion in much the same way I had been when I first felt the gardener's presence in the cottage, that's another part of this book, in Cather's attic room that day, I was engulfed by the spirit of the strong-willed, remarkable girl who'd once inhabited it. So um, one thing that is intriguing to me, um, this is an excellent book, by the way, Private Way, one thing that is intriguing to me is how, as we read, we come across authors being discussed by other authors. So I had chosen to read this book, kind of unrelated to Willa Cather, I thought. It's called Constructing a Nervous System, a Memoir by Margot Jefferson. It was like a finalist for a prize, and that's how I get a lot of my best ideas for books. So Margot Jefferson, African-American woman, lives in New York. She's a prolific criti critic and writer, um, very much part of the cultural scene there, has taught literature a lot. Uh, this book is really interesting for being very nonlinear, but fascinating for her views of people and her points of view about things. And she has a pretty long section in this book about Willa Cather. And she's taught Willa Cather's books. Um, Margot Jefferson has what I would, I, I mean, I guess it's not, it's a fairly cliche way, way of putting it, but a real love-hate relationship with Willa Cather, having loved her books and taught her books to a lot of students um, and really having a lot of affection for them. But Margot Jefferson, as an African-American woman, a gay woman, and um, one who is an advocate for others, feels like Willa Cather falls short of where she could have been in terms of some of her portrayals of black people or others. And 
one of her lines of thought has to do with Cather's fascination with um, the white arms of a woman in the story. And Margot Jefferson kind of explores her own point of view about this. And then she gets to a point where she, I would say, resolves her feelings about it and why she feels so much intense disappointment. And uh, throughout the book, that's what she does in this book, I think, is she wrote this book saying, here's some things I'm thinking about. And through the writing of the book, comes to some ideas about it. So um, actually, Margot Jefferson is going to be one of the speakers at the Cather Conference in New York this summer. So um, people who are part of, say, the Willa Cather Foundation, um, active in Red Cloud and other places, invited her to come speak at their convention, which I think is fabulous, to say, from my point of view, here's what I see, here's what I love, here's what I question, here's what I wish I would do differently. But I was completely intrigued by, in the midst of this book, suddenly I'm reading about Willa Cather. And so um, Constructing a Nervous System by Margot Jefferson is one where if you kind of want a different point of view and to kind of take her experience and understand it, Constructing a Nervous System. Kind of um, taking that idea a little bit farther with your experience of Nebraska, I haven't had a chance to talk to either author of this book, but Amber Ruffin and Lacey Lamar have written the book, You'll Never Believe What Happened to Lacey, Crazy Stories About Racism. So this book is written by two sisters who grew up in Omaha, one of whom still lives there, Lacey. And frankly, it is stories of Lacey's experiences of racism, just kind of in an everyday sort of way in Omaha. And the way they write it and the way that they are together as sisters, <coughs> pardon me, as sisters, this book is written as a conversation between the two of them. So the fonts are different for each sister. Um, this is one of those books where sometimes things are just so funny you have to laugh, but then they're just so appalling and sad that you wonder why you're laughing. Um, but I certainly recommend it in that this is their experience of our state uh, right now. And so um, this book has been selected in a few cities and by a few organizations as a real focus book for Nebraskans to understand what maybe the experience of Nebraska, this is Nebraska, is like for others. Um, as I said, I have never had a chance to talk with Lacey about this book, but I would love to. And I understand that a uh, sequel has either just been published or will be published soon. One of the things that Amber says about Lacey is that um, Lacey is petite and she is polite. And so for whatever reason, uh, she's on the receiving end of a lot of odd and interesting comments. And in this um, preface, Amber, who lives in New York now, describes how Lacey will give her a call and say, can you talk? And then Lacey will describe something that happens to her. And um, so she kind of introduces the book about how that is. And then she writes, now I understand all of this sounds harsh, but you have to know that this is not a book full of sad stories. The previous paragraph was the saddest it will get for a while. Black people hear stories like these so frequently that it takes a lot for it to start to hurt our feelings. We have all been through it. But dare I say, you ain't been through it like Lacey. Black readers will read these stories and feel that really good yet terrible feeling of going through something bad and realizing you're not alone. And not only that, but that someone else has it worse. And hopefully the white reader is going to read this, feel sad, think a little about it, feel like an ally come to a greater understanding of the depth of this kind of shit, is what she writes, and maybe walk away with a different point of view to what it's like to be a black American in the 21st century, hence this book. So not an easy book to read, but certainly one that if what we're saying is, how do we pull together a group of books about Nebraska? This is certainly one that, that needs to be considered. I would also mention that um, Roxane Gay, who is an African American, cultural personality, uh, an African-American woman also, uh, grew up largely in Omaha, and some of her books also mention her growing up there and, and give another view about Omaha and Nebraska generally. Um, a person whose book I just simply neglected to bring is Rainbow Rowell in Omaha, has written a lot of contemporary um, books as well about the Nebraska experience, and she includes a lot of specific, uh, mentions of specific places. So if you're somebody who's familiar with Omaha, it's fun to read her books because you recognize where the people are and, and what they're doing. So as I, as I finish up, there are a few things that I would just like to mention. Um, back to Sandoz and Cather for just a moment. 
I um, reread Old Jewels by Mari Sandoz, the story of her father, who was a, a pioneer in Nebraska, a very harsh person. How many of you have read Old Jewels? Say, quite a few of you have. Um, I think that brutal is the word that gets used a lot when people talk about the story of Old Jules because he, he could be a very brutal personality. He was pretty self-centered, um, especially when you think of what his relationship was like with his family. But, um, and Mari Sandoz used Old Jules, that book won a remarkable national prize and really launched her in her writing at a time when she really needed that kind of encouragement, but it's not an easy book to read necessarily. Um, Capital City is one of her fictional books from around the 30s where she's, well, Capital City well could be Lincoln. It's a college town, that's the state capital. Uh, Mari Sando said she did lots of research in lots of states, it's not necessarily Lincoln, but uh, you see this city, warts and all, and lots of warts, frankly. Um, I'm. I feel like I should spend a little more time and attention with Mari Sandoz because I enjoy reading her, but I, I don't sense art from her in the way that I want to sense art from an author necessarily. So after I read Capital City, I reread My Antonia by Willa Cather, which is more to my mind of a piece of art, frankly. And so I've been giving a lot of thought to, as we think about this whole This is Nebraska theme, how does each of those authors contribute to, to those books? What is it that they offer? And um, how, do we, how do we experience those? Um, I thoroughly enjoyed rereading my, my Antonia. I hadn't read it for several years. And as I said, I like to mark passages about the beauty of nature. And oh my goodness, I had lots and lots of, of marks in that book because of the way she's able to see the scenery and describe it so well. I will hope to be able to share just a few selections of hers as we end up. Um, then as we were doing This is Nebraska, uh, this interesting thing came up in the New York Times Magazine in December. So um, in the New York Times Magazine, they run a poem every week, and then there's a little bit of explanation about why the person chose it. So on December, um, let's see, middle of December of last year, December 11th, the poem was by Kwame Dawes, who is a Prairie Schooner, right? Uh, editor of Prairie Schooner, he's on the Nebra University of Nebraska faculty, uh, a writer in many different genres. But the person who chose this book is named Victoria Chang, and this is what she wrote about the poem by Kwame Dawes that then I'll read to you. She wrote, when I think of Nebraska poems, I mostly think of Ted Couser and the poem So This Is Nebraska, which celebrates the slow vastness of the state with an assertive, universal, and personal you. This poem by Kwame Dawes, however, aptly describes the way an outsider beyond Couser's all-encompassing you might fill in a state with a preserved culture of restraint and decorum unfamiliar to the speaker. Dawes' speaker feels invisible and asynchronous. They cannot see the despair in my eyes. By the end, the speaker has loosened decorum and commands someone, anyone, to look at my eyes, pay attention, as if ordering the speaker himself to remember he is alive, visible and real, in an infinite and unfamiliar land. So this is a, a poem called Advent by Kwame Dawes. Christmas falls on a Friday. The long week of labor and waiting is gray with dull light, and gradually the gloom fills my bones. I have declared myself a fat man once too often. Here in Nebraska, I have learned the art of restraint. Hoarding lamentations and complaints, how to hold my tongue until it is clear that those around me have unlearned the rituals of compassion. They cannot see the despair in my eyes. Remember when we knew that simply speaking out, our bile would release it from our bodies, that leaching chemistry of confession or hoping, not here. Here the body creates a membrane of such leathery resilience that it may keep in all the wounds we have collected. And here in the slow march to Christmas, I grow bloated with decency, and I have decided to grow my beard again, the uniform of a man pioneering the wilderness. At church, the choir did not sing a Christmas song. It is as if someone forgot the season but the pastors and elders all wore suits and ties while we clapped our hands to the radio songs, good, clean Jesus of Chick-fil-A and Texas charm. Look at my eyes, pay attention, clouds slow moving across the prairie sky, 
so slow it is as if nothing is moving across the bigness of things. Hmm. So the question is, what is the poem? This is, so this is Nebraska by Ted Kuser. So I'm going to share that one with you now. So this is Nebraska. The gravel road rides with a slow gallop over the fields, the telephone lines streaming behind, its billow of dust full of the sparks of red winged blackbirds. On either side, those dear old ladies, the loosening barns, their little windows dulled by cataracts of hay and cobwebs, hide broken tractors under their skirts. So this is Nebraska, a Sunday afternoon, July, driving along with your hand out, squeezing the air, a metal arc waiting on every post. Behind a shelter belt of cedars, top deep in hollyhocks, pollen and bees, a pickup kicks its fenders off and settles back to read the clouds. You feel like that. You feel like letting your tires go flat like letting the mice build a nest in your muffler, like being no more than a truck in the weeds, clucking with chickens or sticky with honey or holding a skinny old man in your lap while he watches the road, waiting for someone to wave to. You feel like waving. You feel like stopping the car and dancing on the road. You wave instead and leave your hand out gliding, lark-like, over the wheat, over the houses. So. Again, thinking this is Nebraska, two, diff two very different writers taking two very different points of view uh, about our state. Um, and I'm intrigued by that. So that's part of what this conversation, I think, has been all about, is that there are so many experiences of Nebraska to consider as we ask that question. Um, I realize that I didn't bring it with me, but if someone said to me, Pat Leach, what is your quintessential Nebraska book? For me, it would be Ted Kuzier's Local Wonders, which if some of you have read it, it's essays, um, some about nature, some about people, some about encounters he's had. And what, to my mind, makes it such a wonderful book is that Ted has a great eye, a great, as his poem demonstrated, a great sense of words and word selection. But when he talks about people, he does such a great job of kind of having a dry and wry sense of humor about people without being mean or mean-spirited. And I'm just totally intrigued by that. Uh, I read Local Wonders kind of late, like probably 20 years after it was published. And I look forward to reading it again. And every so often, I'll just pick up a copy that I have and, and read a few pieces. But I feel like when I think what book best describes my experience of Nebraska, I would say Local Wonders. Then I just want to end with a few quotes from Willa Cather about spring. So I almost brought a few that were winter, but I thought that would be mean. Um, here are a few things that she wrote. This one is from O Pioneers. There are few scenes more gratifying than a spring plowing in that country where the furrows of a single field, often a mile in length, and the brown earth with such strong, clean smell and such a power of growth and fertility in it yields itself eagerly to the plow. And then from one of ours, Claude could remember warm spring days when the plum bushes were all in blossom and Mahaley used to lie down under them and sing to herself as if the honey heavy sweetness made her drowsy. And then this one is from my Antonia. On the edge of the prairie where the sun had gone down, the sky was turquoise blue like a lake with gold light throbbing in it. Higher up in the utter clarity of the western slope, the evening star hung like a lamp suspended by silver chains like a lamp, like the lamp engraved upon the title page of Latin texts. So um, I, want, I wanted to end with some actual writing of Nebraska authors. And I want to also end by thanking you for being here today and thanking the members of the NLHA for organizing this event and for everything they do to support the heritage of Nebraska authors. I'm always happy to talk about books. So uh, if you run into me somewhere, feel free to pull me aside and. We'd be happy, I'd be happy to talk some more about books. So thanks again for being part of it today. Hi, Pat, and I want to thank you. I'm Diane Wilson, the curator of the Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors that Pat mentioned downstairs. And on behalf of Anna Leitche and the Heritage Room, I want to present you a mug. Thank, thank you, you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you.